Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Talking Cardboard. My name is Corey. And I'm John. And today's video is our top 10 favorite board games of all time as of January of 2024. We're super excited for today's video, so let's get right into it. Yes, that's right. Today's video is our top 10 favorite board games of all time. I think we've got some changes to the list, probably some games that have not changed at all over the last year, but excited to see what John has in store for us specifically. I don't know John's list. He doesn't know mine. So let's just get started with your number 10. All right. My number 10 this year is a game that was so far down my list last year that I don't even remember what number it was. <laughs> But that is Ankh, Gods of Egypt. Oh, all uh, right. Spoilers, this is kind of changing up my thoughts on all the Eric Lane games. Mm. At one point, I had Blood Rage in my top 10, which is also a great game. But I just felt lately that with more playthroughs of Ankh, I've really been enjoying this game a lot. I like the abilities and asymmetryness of the different Egyptian gods that you play as, as well as kind of the Kemet-esque factor of the mythological creatures that you hire in this game, and just, you know, the tug of war that happens with the monuments, how the regions get split up as you play through. There's just a lot of mechanics in this game that changed, got changed up from like when Blood Rage was introduced that I just really click with me and I enjoy a ton, so it made it right at the bottom of the list at top 10. Yeah, and I think that's gonna be a common theme, especially for between John and I, where the more we play a game or the more recently we play a game, it kind of reinvigorates that game. Yep. It kind of brings it to the forefront again. So that is definitely a common theme on my list as well. And a good pick. I know we've been getting knocked to the table quite a bit. So and with that, Corey, what's your number 10 game of all time? My number 10 was number eight last year. So it dropped just two spots, staying strong in the top 10 though. And is one of my favorite Stefan Feld games of all time, not my favorite, Stefan Feld, but one of them, and it is Trajan. And I don't remember if we've played Trajan or not recently. Once at least, but not any time recently. Okay. My wife and I have gotten into the table recently over the last couple of weeks, and it uh, it just sparked, you know, re-sparked and reinvigorated the game again for me. You know, it was my number eight last year, still number 10, still top 10 game of all time, and I just love the way this game sings with its mechanisms. The core mechanism in Trajan is a, like a rondelle, almost like a Mancala yep. system game. And it's just a, a smorgasbord of different uh, different ways to get victory points in this game. I just love trying to kind of max man the different little mini games that you have going around on the board, all in the while just moving those Mancala pieces, trying to match up the different colors and the different components with that. And the game feels like it plays at a pretty quick clip too. It's about like a two player game is about an hour and a half, maybe two hours at the most, but uh, the whole time you're you're having fun trying to find different ways to score a lot of different points. So really love Trajan. Yeah, I do remember that Moncala style wheel. Mm -hmm. That was very interesting trying to plan your actions ahead. And I would agree the different mechanisms or the mini games, as you said, mm -hmm. on your board and figuring out how to best strategize your path to victory. It was very interesting to figure out. All right, now moving into our number nine favorite game of all time. John, what do you got? Mine is not straying too far from last year. Uh, moving up from number 10 to number nine, Ooh. and that is Star Wars Rebellion. Yep. I mean, I had to have at least one Star Wars game on my list. There might be more. I honestly <laughs> don't remember. But Star Wars Rebellion is a great two-player game that I feel really encapsulates the feel of the Empire vs. the Rebellion. Essentially, if you haven't played it before, one player takes on the role of the Empire, one takes on the role of the rebels mm -hmm. and essentially the empire is sending their probe droids out through the galaxy and their forces to find the re hidden rebel base and the rebels are trying to complete as many objectives as they can to thwart the empire's plan and essentially bring balance to the galaxy mm -hmm. again great game there's a ton more involved with this from leaders that you send around the board to complete uh objective cards that you have in your hand to almost having like uh, Axe and Allies style units that you're on the board that you're going into combat with. And then just the whole kind of mind game of the rebel base and you have the opportunity to move it around when you think that fire is getting close, but you're trying not to give away too much. So I think 
it's really well balanced. It really shines with the expansion that added some of like the Rogue One uh, movie elements into the game and sort of cleaned up combat a little more. Yeah. But really, really fun Star Wars themed game uh, that can be played at two players. Yeah, I think it is one of the best two-player games of all time. And if you're a Star Wars fan, it is like a must-play. Yep. And it's it's too bad, almost too bad, that we only get to play it maybe like once a year, I like know. on May 4th. Yep. Um, it really deserves multiple plays, you know, a lot more plays than what we get it to the table. Uh, a ton of fun. This game is kind of like in the same genre of like uh, like War of the Ring or like yep. the new like Dune War for Arrakis game that I just picked up. And I just... I, I love those bigger, very thematic two-player games. And this is definitely one that fits into yes, that category. Yes, 100%. Yep. So really, really like that one too. Good pick. Yeah, with that, Corey, what's sitting at your number nine this year? My number nine was number 12 last year. So just squeaking up into the top 10 now, but still staying pretty strong. Honestly, any year, uh, some of these games could drop down to the top 20, back up to the top 10. It just kind of depends on how often we get them played, like we just mentioned. And uh, I think the reason why this one jumped up to number nine this year is because I actually taught it at uh, Con of the North this year, our local convention here in uh, the Minneapolis area, Minnesota. And it is Broom Service. Oh, yeah. That's right. <laughs> Trying to think of what game you were going to say. I was like, I'm pretty Which sure you did Brass, it? Yeah. but I'm pretty sure Spoilers, yeah. that might be a little higher. Yeah, that's but not number Broom nine. Service, this makes sense. I forgot about that yeah. one. Broom Service is just fantastic. It's just one of the most underrated games out there. It came out in a time of gaming where board gaming was just kind of coming into fruition for its modern day, modern age board gaming. And it's one of those that's easily overlooked. I think kind of based on like the artwork or the theme itself, it's not very interesting to look at. The board isn't very interesting to look at. It's it's colorful, but it's just kind of like you're flying around on broomsticks trying to collect potions and deliver them to different towers. Yep. And it's like, you know, that doesn't sound that great, but that interesting. But the mechanisms at the again, heart of the game are really, really cool. Yes. yes I'll I, let you explain that. I was going to say, again, the mechanisms is just really cool where everybody starts the game with the same 10 cards, and before the round, round starts, I believe it's you, you select four cards or whatever it, it varies depending on the on the round two but you, you select four cards and those are the actions you can do for the turn and when you play a card to do an action you can either choose the brave action or the cowardly action on the card and the dynamic between that is really cool if you choose the cowardly action it's not quite as good as the brave action but you automatically get to take mm -hmm. the reward from it and get to do the action if you go and try to play the brave action you can get a uh, a reward that's a fantastic, a lot, a lot better of a reward, but you're risking not getting it at all, because if somebody else follows suit around the table and chooses the brave action for that same suit card or that same color card, they steal that action completely from you, and you don't get to do anything on your turn. Yeah, and that's really cool because it's almost a push your luck mechanic yeah. to some extent, because out of the ten cards, you're kind of just hedging your bet. Like, do the people after me in turn order even pick this card yeah. first of all, or you know? You can take the easy route out, and if you're the last person in Torn order, you know it's a safe bet that you can just kind of yep. screw everyone else in front of you over and yep. just be like, brave, done. Yep. Yep. So it's it's a very interesting mechanic, like Corey was saying. Push your luck, pick up and deliver. If you like both of those, definitely give this game a try. It is fantastic. And another thing too is just trying to like outwit, I'll guess your opponent is another uh, another uh, big aspect of the game. But another thing I want to add to that too is turn order is really big in this game also because if you are the last player to choose the brave action, you then have to go first in tur turn order for That's that right. next turn. So then you're kind of in a bad position for, for getting another brave action off. So it's really kind of cool to... Even if you are in a position to throw down that brave card, you might just throw it down as a cowardly action to then uh, continue on with your uh, spot in turn order. Yep. So very, very cool dynamic to the game. That's my number nine, Broom Service. Moving on to number eight on the list. Over to John first. This is a game I actually haven't played in a while, but it was like a smash hit kind of towards the middle of last year. Mm -hmm. And it was Corey's brother that actually introduced us to this game. And that game is Moonrakers. Uh, yeah, great game. Brand new, new to the list? Yeah, yeah that's mine to too. My number eight as well is Moonrakers. Well, perfect. Yeah. I'll let you take it away. You want uh, me to take it away? I remember certain parts of the game. <laughs> I know it was a ton of fun. Yeah. I don't know if I could explain the whole game. Yeah, Moonrakers is an interesting one. It's definitely kind of like a piggyback type of game where you're trying to piggyback of a, off of other people or trying to bring people on like a mission with you. Um, yeah, I was kind of missions. thinking of it as a mini deck builder slash objective completion slash negotiation game. Yeah, there is a lot of negotiation. That's a good way to put it. I... I kind of explain when I when I introduce this game to people, I explain it in a way where I say it's like Munchkin, but a million times better. 
Yeah, that's that's a good way yeah. to look at it. Because yep. in Munchkin, you're kicking down a door. There's a reward. You can say, hey, join me on this mission. Yep. Try to complete it, and I'll give you some of the reward, but I'm going to take some of it as well. And you negotiate on who's going to get that reward. Same thing in Moonrakers. You are negotiating like, hey, I'll take the VPs here if you if you take the money or you take this reward and that. And you can negotiate before going on that mission. And then if you can, you and your teammates can beat the mission, you get the reward. Or you just say, hey, I'm going to try to complete this card on my own. Right. And, and the best part yeah. is, even though you're doing these no negotiations, like you could say like, hey, I'm going to invest X amount of resources into your mission to help you complete it at the cost of this. Yeah. I mean, you could be bluffing too, and you yeah. might not even have those things. And when it comes to your turn to help out, you could do nothing and still hope that people <laughs> complete the mission because you're still going to get those rewards yep. regardless of what you actually put forward. It's also really cool that... Some of the missions have like combat dice involved where damage can be dealt back to you and yeah. you can even negotiate to be the target of that damage. Yeah. Um I'm gonna be instead the of shield. getting rewards. Yeah. Yeah, I'll take all the damage if you guys give me at least some of the reward. Yep. Because I'm not contributing as much. I would say worth the money. Yep. If you can afford it, but it is very expensive. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so. That is the one negative. But yeah, very, very fun. So yeah. So that's our number eight collectively, Moonrakers. All right, and that brings me to my number seven game of all time. And this is the same number seven from last year, and that game is Queen Domino. Mm. Uh, it's a game I love teaching people. It's a game I can easily bring to any kind of get-together where board games are involved, uh, just because it's so simple to teach people and easy to play that it's Wasn't it's that great. your number one once upon a time? It was close to... It, it was like top three for quite a few years. Okay. Um, but yeah, I finally kind of dropped down, just didn't get played as much as uh, the collection has grown. But Queen Domino, great tile placement game. You're just drafting tiles uh, between four or two to four players. Really simple mechanic there, but kind of adds an extra level on top of just being like a simple like domino game. And really all you're trying to do is maximize your kingdoms through a system of like matching the type of territory and the crowns within it to gain points at the end of the game uh, there are some other mechanics thrown in with these buildings you can put onto certain tiles as well as uh, the dragon towers and the princess and mm -hmm. there's tons of little intricacies that got added on top of king domino to make this game but really easy to play really quick to play uh, and still just a really really good time overall yeah, so. I would say this one would be a great candidate for if we did a top 10 games list where it's like top 10 simplest games to teach and play that have a lot of depth to it yep. or a lot of crunch yep. to it. So definitely a good pick there. My number seven this year was number four last year, so dropping a little bit to make some room for some other games here, but still staying really strong. And this is my favorite Stefan Feld game of all time. And, you know, to be real honest, the more I'm playing Trajan, you know, this these could flip-flop in the future, but at least for now and for, for you know, however many years to come, it is Castles of Burgundy. Mm, good one. Yeah, Castle of, my Bur Castle of Burgundy, my number seven, uh, fantastic game. And this is another one, again, like Queen Domino, that's very simple to teach, um, but has a lot of uh, a lot of gameplay, a lot of depth to it when you're trying to strategize on what to do. Also has tile placement mechanics, which also everyone has loves. That. Yes, definitely, um, definitely a tile selection, tile placement type of game built into like a Euro. And really, again, the core mechanism of just rolling two dice and doing actions with those dice is all it comes down to. Yep. Very, very simple mechanically, very simple on the surface, but uh, again, kind of a smorgasbord of different things you can do on the main board to, like John said, grab tiles onto your main space and then use dice to place those tiles uh, from your storage onto your duchy and try to essentially, create not really not really kingdom. set collection, but yeah, yeah, like a kingdom in different zones to try to uh, maximize that. And the earlier you can complete different zones on the, on the map, the more points you get for that as well. So it's kind of a race to get to get points in different aspects of it as well. But just simply roll two dice and what can I do with those um, is all, all it comes down to teaching the game. So one of Stefan Feld's best, I think, for how streamlined it, the game is with yep. the amount of strategy that's involved with it and plays great from two to four players. All player counts play very, very quickly and, and easily. So that is Castles of Burgundy. All right, now on to number six. John, what do you got? Yeah, number six. This game was my number nine last year, sort of. I'm considering it the same game to some extent, okay. but this year my number six is Clank in Space. Ooh. I think at number nine last year I had Clank Catacombs, but 
functionally not a big difference between the two. There are some mechanics that separate them, but I really like Clank in general because of its dungeon delving adventure type style of game it is. Mm -hmm. And it also involves deck building, which I also am a big fan of. Yeah. I think the deck building mechanics in Clank in Space are probably the best of all the Clank games. Mm -hmm. uh, there's more combos and cards that work together, uh, as well as other items you can gain in the game to make your deck better. Uh, and then I also like the dungeon, like I mentioned, the dungeon delving aspect of the game where Again, you're trying to push your luck with how deep into the space station you want to go to get your artifact before escaping on the escape pod. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I really like that. I like the fact that you can be completely eliminated from the game and score zero points. <laughs> or if you can make it to a certain checkpoint, you're at least scoring your points but not escaping. I love that. Or, you know, if you can really do well, you get your escape pod, get out, maximize the points you can get. And I think that's really cool. Uh, Clank in Space also added a mechanic that kind of, the pass keys, mm -hmm. where it kind of gates you off from getting an artifact too soon, like the original Clank game did, and I really, really like that aspect to this game and why it's probably above the other Clank games. It mitigates that jump in, jump out yep. type of yep. strategy. For someone that might not want to play or they just want to cheat, try to cheese the system, and it's yeah. like, all right, but Clank yep. in Space kind of solved that through the pass key uh, mechanic. I will say in the wide breadth of different games that are in the Clank universe, Clank in Space was ahead of its time. Mm -hmm. Chronologically, it came before a lot of the other ones, but I think it was, uh, I guess, like I'm saying, ahead of its time, it should have been chronologically the last game, I believe, in the lineup because of some of the things it did. Like with um, like the new Dune Imperium game. Uh, help me out with the name of it. Uh, the new 2.0 version of Dune Imperium. No, oh, Uprising. Uprising, yeah. Like Dune, Dune Imperium Uprising. Some of the tweaks and some of the things that Dune Imperium Uprising did to the Dune Imperium system is kind of what I liken that to uh, to Clank and Space in the yep. Clank overall system. Yep. It really cleaned up a lot of things. And then, like John said, too, thematically, the cards just are really fun to play and make a lot yep. of sense. There's, like, essentially lightsabers and different things on some of the cards, too. <laughs> so, it's uh, yeah, that's a, good, that's a good pick. I like that one a lot. Number six for me, um, I feel bad for putting it at number six. It was number five last year, but I guess I really shouldn't feel too bad about any not of the games in the top change, ten. Yeah. yeah, not too big a deal. Uh, I think it's it's falling a little bit and probably will continue to fall a little bit because I enjoy playing it most at maybe only one to two players. Uh, when, this game, when you play three or four players, it just gets a little bit too long for my liking. And this game is Spirit Island. Spirit Island... Uh, my favorite, I think it's my favorite cooperative game of all time. Probably one of the heaviest games on my list as well. Um, to when you start throwing in some of the adversaries and different things going on with the game, and especially when you throw in the expansions, this game can get pretty fiddly pretty quick. Oh yeah, easily. Yep. yep. But uh, if you if you spend the time to learn it and to really uh, dive into it and and give it it uh, give it give it some honest attention, uh, you you will really um, reap the rewards from that. It's it's a game that if you you know, give it some time, really learn the ins and outs, sit down and give it a solid try. I think you'll fall in love with it. It's uh, it's super heavy, super difficult to win. It's another type of thing I like in cooperative games is that if it's difficult to win, it, it makes you want to bring it back to the table over and over again. And uh, yeah, with the expansions, with the different... Um, uh, the different adversaries and different things you can throw into this game, you can really mitigate the the difficulty in this game as well. And that's what I really like in a good cooperative game too. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't even know if I've played with a lot of the like adversaries or add-ons to this game, but mm -hmm. I know immediately I got drawn to this game after the first playthrough of just looking at like all the different spirits you can be and yep. how intricate the game is even before you like take the first turn because you're already sitting there going through the spirits and be like, oh, what pairs with what, and like, what's going to make a good strategy before, like I said, before you're even starting to play the game. You're yeah. already like invested into what's going to happen, and I think that's really cool. And all the spears are very asymmetrical and how they play and what abilities they can do on the island and affect the game. So, yeah, and really, that, really cool. That asymmetry is one of the things that when we first started the channel was one of the detriments yeah. to uh, <laughs> the, kind of the bane of our existence. Yeah, there was a lot of <laughs> themes on asymmetry early on, uh, roots, <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah. where mm -hmm. we, a little too much for us at the time, yeah. but um, asymmetry has I easily become one of the better aspects of games yep. uh, to keep things fresh and... Uh, Lively. It's definitely grown on me. Now it's become a positive. If I see a game with asymmetry, it immediately sparks my interest. Yeah. Whereas before it might have been the opposite. So 
That is my number six, Spirit Island. And now on to my number five, which has already been mentioned by Corey, hmm. but it is The Castles of Burgundy. Really? My favorite Stefan Feld game, <laughs> apparently. Whatever. I'm very bad at remembering my developers and designers. But again, not going to dive into this one too much. I like the tile placement aspects. I like the simplicity of rolling your two dice and kind of going through how you're going to maximize your turn using those two dice and what actions they can actually spark off for you and get you the best best duchy uh, that you can create. So yeah, number five, Castle of Burgundy. Yep. Again, just a marvel of a design. Rolling two dice and here are your options. It, d- it doesn't sound very fun, but it yes, definitely it, is. it is. And I should mention, this was number five last year, so it's not gone <laughs> up or down. Just stayed where it was. Because Great staple. tile placement, that's why. Yeah. Because <laughs> tiles. Uh, my number five was number 10 last year. It is climbing because we have actually played it, played it a couple times this year, and I am super excited for the Legendary Edition coming out this year that I backed on Kickstarter. Or Castles Game of Kong. Burgundy. No, oh. but that is a good one, and another very expensive version I wish I had. <laughs> um, but yeah, this game is Cyclades. Oh, yes. Yes. Yep. So Cyclades, I did back like the Legendary, Mythic, whatever, all-in miniatures version of it, and it's supposed to be coming in the mail this later this year. Super excited for it. Just a ton of fun, again, with the mechanisms, like the, the auctioning over the actions yeah. <laughs> is really cool. Um, the way the way they pop off from top to the bottom is really fun as well because those change every round. Yes, exactly. Yep. yep. So the different the different gods get mixed up and get uh, kind of spit out in a random order each round, and how those pop off from top to bottom, depending on the, the board state and everything going on, um, really makes it very interesting and you really have to pay attention to what your opponents are doing and where they're at and what you think they're going to try to take over before you uh, take an action and then everybody has their own um, player screen that they're hiding their money that they're using to bid over these actions with so you're really trying to guess like oh hey if they just spent 14 gold last turn on that la- that last action maybe they don't have quite enough to overtake me if I spend this much on this action. So that those head games, kind of like in Moonrakers, uh, I really appreciated that about Moonrakers. I appreciate the same thing about Cyclades. Yeah, I like Cyclades. Pretty easy area control-ish mm-hmm. game, I guess I would classify it as. Yeah. Um, yeah, I like the dynamic between the different players and, you know, trying to prevent each other and jockey for getting the two metropolises uh, mm-hmm. before anyone else and, you know, Plenty of different paths to get there, which makes the game nice instead of, you know, just taking over yeah. locations. It's not all based on area control. All right, moving into our number four favorite game of all time. What do you got for number four, John? Yeah, this was number three last year. Dropped one spot, probably just due to my excitement over a couple of other games on the list here at top three, but still a very solid game. And I'm sure you'll hear more about this game from Corey because that game is Brass Birmingham. Hmm, never heard of it. Really, really like the mechanics of this game with using your cards to place industry tiles onto the board. And then you're trying to ship your goods off uh, to essentially gain points. Uh, you're really trying to maximize what you can do with your hand of cards each round because this game is very tight when it comes to the money you're giving Mm -hmm. or given and you actually have to as an action take loans in this game in order to further build your industry and increase your income in the future Uh, so i think that's a really really cool balance with how tight that mechanism works and just trying to maximize what you can do is makes the strategy of this game very intriguing and that's why i have it at number four yeah good pick never heard of it but i'm gonna have to give that a try sometime (laughs) uh my number four was the biggest jump up on the list this year it was number 49 last year so still in my top 50 favorite games of all time but now number four and i liken i liken it to a couple things a couple new expansions i have integrated into the game and we've played it a lot more lately and the other thing is is like normally I play this style game a lot with my wife, but because we've been getting the game um, to the table as a group more lately too. Dungeon Fighter. It's <laughs> it's not Dungeon Fighter. No. That's not even my top 100, but <laughs> yeah, depending on who you ask, maybe one of my brothers likes that one a little bit better. <laughs> um, but yeah, just getting it to the table more often lately with the two expansions thrown into the base game has really elevated this game and jumping it all the way up to number four, Lost Ruins of Arnak. Oh yeah, that's a good one. Yep. I've been liking that game. Yeah. So um, it's uh, it's 
it's gotten some fresh kind of breath of life kind of uh, breathed into it a little bit because the gaming group has asked for more lately. We have got, been getting it to the table more, but like I said too, it has two expansions with it now that I never really played with any of the expansion material before, but then we started throwing that in and I'm really liking the, more of the variability. It's got more of the variable, variable uh, boards, player powers, again, asymmetric powers when it comes to the player boards, um, different uh, different tracks you can throw on the board. So just a ton of variability, but this is another deck building worker placement style. Yep. Game. Yep. So this is in kind of the same genre of like Dune Imperium or other games like that, where the deck building feels really fun. And the cards you play uh, dictate where you can send your Yeah, workers. I'd even say it's a little more tight on the deck building because this game has a set number of rounds as you're playing. Yeah. It. And it does 25. seem to go by quickly. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very strategic with the moves you are making and the cards you are buying because you can easily get too many cards or just not have enough if you're buying the wrong stuff. Yep. It's just going to hurt you that much more. So very, very intriguing mechanism with the deck building, and I, I really like that about it. Yeah, that is one of the most interesting desi design decisions that the designers made with the deck building in this game. You've got items and you have artifact cards. You have two different yes, styles of cards, yeah. and those play out both very differently. Yep. Like the items are more just traditional. You buy them and send them to... And they do something. Yeah. yeah. Or they help you get your agent or uh, your... I can't remember what the people are called, your explorers, explorers or something, yeah. yep. out to the spaces, or they have an ability on them that you can use. Yep. Or the artifact card, as soon as you buy it, you get to do the action on that card, and then it gets sent to the discard pile, so then when it recirculates, there is a cost now associated with playing it again, but you get that immediately. So like John said, it's only a five-round game, it goes by really quick, but some of those cards you're buying, you get to pop off their action immediately, so you're not just sending them to the deck and just hoping and praying that you draw that card yep. later, later in the game. So. Really unique, really neat, neat and unique with that, and then also like the theme behind it, like the Indiana Jones style theme, like sending your worker off to these different temples and fighting these guardians and trying to overcome the guardians. And when they do, uh, those open up different worker placement spots for you and your opponents to then travel to and get these awesome rewards and benefits from those new spots. That is my number four, Lost Ruins of Arnak. All right, now moving into the top three best board games of all time in our opinion, starting with John. Yeah, my number three was actually number 13 last year. I think it was kind of a newer game to me, but I've been playing this a lot with a high school buddy and gotten through actually the whole campaign for the game I picked as my I know which one three, is and that's Undaunted Normandy. And I should caveat that in general, I think my top, my number three is like all the Undaunted yeah, games. Like Stalingrad uh, too. Yeah, I've, I've been playing Stalingrad with Nick. Uh, we just started the North Africa campaign uh, with my high school buddy that I mentioned we we played through the whole Normandy, Normandy campaign, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a blast. I mean, it's a really straightforward two-player war strategy deck building game, and you know you're just trying to build out your deck, and you're just trying to utilize that deck and the tokens on the board to complete objectives uh, on the like tile map that you have uh, for each scenario. And, you know, some of the tiles will get objectives. And, yeah, you just have to best figure out how to make that work. Yeah, so I was just trying to quick glance at my list there because I thought it was in my top 50. I don't know if I just forgot about it, but definitely, definitely a good pick. A really fun, like a, like a lighter war style yeah, game. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's not overly complicated. Uh, Stalingrad's really cool. It is a legacy style game. However, it can be easily reset if you ever want to play it again. Hmm. So... I think that's what's unique about it. and Soldiers can get wounded. And... Yeah, you'll have soldiers permanently die. You'll get like veterans in the game. And I think North Africa adds like a vehicle mechanic to the game and different types of soldiers. So all the Undaunted in general, I've really, really enjoyed. And yeah, that's my number three. And the futuristic 2200 AD. Or yeah, whatever. I forgot about that. That's coming <laughs> out maybe this year. I, I don't so. remember. Yeah. But yeah, they're doing a sci-fi version of undaunted and super excited for that and to see what that brings can't wait my number three was number three last year so staying strong and steady and uh a game that i wish we would get to the table more and i i guess we do play it enough i i would think we get it to the table at least maybe once or twice a year and this game is great western trail and um 
Yeah, one that uh, that really came out swinging. Uh, it was a really popular game when it first um, came out, and it's got since a second edition yep. and a reprinting and a bunch of different uh, new themes associated with it as well. But uh, Great Western Trail is just fantastic. It's essentially a, a rondelle style game where you're uh, going down the Great Western Trail. You sell cattle. That's yep. all I know. Yep. You basically have a hand of cattle, different different various types of cows in your hand, and you're trying to get to the end of the trail, having um, each card be a different type of cow to get, maximize the most amount of money you get for it, the most amount of points you get it, get for it, and then you are shipping them off to different cities using the train mechanism at the end of the route as well. What I really like about Great Western Trail is that it's not really a deck building game, but you're it's like a hand mitigation game yep. where oh, I've got a ton of these, one type of cow, I want to go to this uh, spot to, to ditch a cow for money and hopefully draw a different cow to, to maximize that action. And then all in the meanwhile, you are really... Uh, there is a lot of player interaction um, in this game for a Euro to where you're going over other people's worker placement spots and uh, putting down these new uh, locations that kind of slow your opponents down as well. Mm -hmm. Or there are certain tiles that actually make your opponents have to pay you money to pass through. And uh, different hazards on the map as well that you're trying to take down um, or, or get through. So it's really cool how you can um, take different paths, uh, literally different paths on the main board to do different actions to try to get to that end of the trail. So... A game that plays a little bit longer. I know it's a little bit harder to get to the table because of that. And it is, um, I would say it's not really a heavy, heavy Euro, but it's kind of a medium to heavy yeah. uh, in the strategy. So, um, but if, if uh, that sounds interesting to you, definitely give it a shot. It's, um, it's definitely one that I believe should be in everyone's collection. So. Yep, down your cowboy hat and get it to the table. That's right. It's a hoot. In the second edition, you actually get cowboy hats to put yeah. on your meeples. So. <laughs> well, yeah, as you uh, hire the cowboys, right? Yeah, Yeah. well, you're for your player color. Yeah, so that is Great Western Trail. All right, our top two games of all time probably haven't changed much. No, it's going to be a little disappointing if people <laughs> are expecting crazy madness here and grander. Yeah. Uh, it's not going to change, but like the games I have at my top two are things I play frequently and probably always will. But they're worth talking about. Yes, 100%. Yeah. So what's your number two? My number two is a card game, and it's a card game I'm sure a ton of people that watch this channel probably play, and that is Magic the Gathering. Hmm. I can't have Magic the Gathering probably not be a top two game because I literally play it with a group of friends almost every Friday night. Mm -hmm. Not quite every Friday night, but it's something that brings us together and has for the last 10 years. Um, and Magic's a game that's tried and true. It's been around since, what, 1993? Mm -hmm. um, not that I've been playing it for that long, but it's just such a legacy game and really fun. I mean, all the expansions that come out, you know, change the game in its own unique ways. And we like to play Commander, which is creating a 100-card deck uh, with 99 unique cards and then a Commander you've built your deck around. Uh, and that's just a blast. I, I don't know if I need to explain more about Magic. I assume anyone who knows has the gist of what Magic is. But yeah, yeah, Magic the Gathering, great game. If you're going to play a card game, it's probably going to be that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, it, and it's definitely one of those games where it has its pros and cons, you know, just like anything. It's it showed it's shown its age a little bit, but the the cool thing about it is everybody's heard of Magic the Gathering. Even if you're a non-gamer or your parents or your grandparents, they've all heard of Magic the Gathering. So uh, it's definitely it's definitely out there. Everybody knows about it. If you haven't played before, you probably know somebody who knows how to play it yeah. who can teach you. And once you learn the game, it'll be stuck with you forever and you won't ever forget it. So that's definitely a pro to it. But the con side of it, though, too, is that at this point, how many hundreds of thousands of different cards are yeah, out there. Yeah, if you're not playing standard and you're only playing commander and yeah. trying to figure that out and you now need to know every card or have some idea of the cards that are out there, it's, yeah, I mean, yeah. you're looking back to, like I said, 1993 when you play commander Yeah, because those cards could pop up. But yep. that's also what makes it cool. You have such a big library to choose from when creating your decks. So Yeah, yeah, very good pick. Yeah. Uh, my number two you might hear about later here on the list from John and there's not not too much later left to go here um, but my number two is Dune Imperium uh, specifically Dune Imperium with the Rise of Ix. Dune Imperium Uprising is definitely climbing the list as well. I would say for people who are just getting into Dune Imperium I would say you either get Dune Imperium with Rise of Ix and have at it or you just get Dune Imperium Uprising because essentially they are both uh, top tier games um, or top tier ways to play Dune Imperium in my opinion. 
Yeah, um, yeah, I would agree. And yeah. like Corey said, this is my number one game of all time. Yeah. Shocker! It was my number one last year, and maybe even the year before that. I can't remember now. It seems, so why do you like it so much? It's it's great. <laughs> it's the way I explain it to anyone is it is the perfect mix between my favorite board game mechanics, and those are area control, mm-hmm. worker placement, and deck building. Yep. I wish there was tile placement, maybe one day, and then it it'd really be it. like that. But it's still got the trifecta of, like I said, area control, worker placement, deck building. Everything in this game is so well balanced. However, you know, at its heart, I would argue this is a worker placement game because that really drives um, everything else you can do. Yeah. Uh, even how you build your deck or uh, get people into the conflict zone for the area control portion I met mention uh the theme plays into this really well i think they did an exceptional job at all the cards you can buy and the special abilities on the leaders that you pick at the start of the game Mm -hmm. all feel very unique and tailored to match the dune universe and what those characters are in the movies or books uh and what they're portraying and you don't have to be a dune fan to like this game no you definitely do (laughs) not like this game plays well like sure i've read the book and watch the movies but that was after i played the game yeah so i liked the game first and that really drove my interest in everything else doom related yeah. uh, which is really cool and helped me understand the game more thoroughly um but yeah really really great game uh it's another game where with all these mechanics your ultimate goal is scoring victory points and trying to race everyone up to the 10 or 12 points that you need to win the game mm-hmm. and then the other thing that makes this game really cool and kind of, un- I wouldn't say unique, but um, gives it some element of surprise are the plot cards in this game that can swing both conflict and endgame scoring. Uh, I think that's a really cool mechanic to add because someone could theoretically end the game but still lose because someone was holding out on endgame scoring in their plot cards. So yeah. I think that's unique and adds another level of complexity to this game that makes it really really fun yeah uh, i'm not gonna really like obviously it's my number two so i just love this game to death but i'm not gonna rinse and repeat everything john just said obviously i love worker placement or you know um uh area control and uh deck building and all that sort of thing as well but uh the main thing for me is turn the caps lock on on your on your keyboard and type out tension because this game like (laughs) i love the tension in it like it makes you sweat just thinking about like Oh, I just how how am I going to uh, win this combat to get those like some of those combats are two victory points right off the bat, which is twenty percent right. of your way to victory. And it's like you know, and trying to min max that and not spend too many work or too many troops from your garrison, you know, to I don't know, just the tension in this game is just palpable. no, it's really good because not <laughs> only are you vying over the conflict, but there's also your allegiances with the different factions that you have to worry about because. Mm-hmm. Your strategy could change or the effects of your cards in your deck could change based on someone getting an allegiance with a faction that Mm -hmm. you have uh, because it can, like some cards, combo with having the alliance with a certain faction. And it's just, like you said, tension and trying to ensure that you are out maneuvering your opponents pretty much at every element of the game yeah and don't take that spot i needed oh you took the spot i needed now how am i gonna pivot and yeah there's just so many layers to this game it's so great um and like we said if even if you're not a dune fan give it a shot you know it's 100 yeah so that is uh my number two your number one dune imperium (laughs) let's just go right into my number one then and we all kind of know what that is it was number one last year which is kind of funny it's been number one the last few years great western trail is actually the top on my list Mm -hmm. for many many years but this one i just don't see it going anywhere anytime soon and that's brass birmingham uh it's another game i taught at con of the north this year uh in this past february i think it was february um and just had a lot of fun and the players i taught it to it was all their first time playing the game and they all had a lot of fun playing it as well uh it it did take them like five and a half hours to play the game when normally it should only be about two to two and a half um because it is just one of those games it's very crunchy it's very crunchy and you're given you're given a hand of cards and you're kind of like well what am i going to do now yep you know and uh 
you can't you can't always pull off exactly what you need to do so you need to know more of the tactical strategy you definitely need to know how to do the best you can with what you're given which i really appreciate in this game but also for a euro game it's got a ton of player interaction where you're literally quite literally using other people's resources that they've generated on their buildings that not only help you out, but also help them out because a big right. part of this game is trying yep. to flip your industries by getting yep. everything off of the tile. But then in turn, there's kind of a unique balance to that too because if you've created a building with a resource on it that you may really need, you don't necessarily want another player to take that. Yep. And just a ton of interaction. <clears throat> um, you're also interacting through each other's connections to trading hubs. Yeah. Yep. Um, like who's going to connect that last piece first? The breweries and the beer that you have to sell off with your goods. Yep. Like... It's more player interaction than you expect at first glance. And that's yeah. what makes this, I think, really great. And like you mentioned, the tightness of making the best with the resources you're given uh, makes yep. it very tactical. Yep. Don't, definitely don't want to be afraid to take a loan in this game. Yep. Um, but I love any game, really, that has residual income going on with having to kind of min-max what you're doing and balance your resources and your income. And all in the while, like, you're just... You're really interacting with those other players and then like just board awareness is huge in this game too um it feels like an area control game that's not an area control yes, game yeah so i, I really that. like that yeah. yeah anything to do with cards and some element of like an area control feel really really elevates a game for me and brass does it very well so that does it for our top 10 favorite games of all time for today's list uh, give us in the comments below some of your top 10 favorite games or top 5 favorite games of all time. Maybe there's some games on there that we have not tried that we would love to try and maybe do a review on it on the channel here. And anything else, any other closing thoughts that you want to say? Check out the games we put on here. I mean, yeah. they're our top 10 for a reason and we'd be ha happy to hear your thoughts on them as well and what you think. And we've put many, many years and many, many hours into playing these games, so we've kind of already done the research for you. So just trust us and go and buy it. So that does it for uh, today's list. Until next time, you all have fun gaming, and see you later.